We're talking about defeater beliefs. And today was and will be at least partly uh, this defeater belief. Is Jesus the only way? Is Christianity the only truth? And things like that. Uh, we, we need to talk about hell and the problem of hell. And that's going to get us into a whole host of issues related to theology and divine providence and uh, God's you know, human, human freedom and uh, divine control and, and things like that. And so we've got a lot of interesting things to do. And what I think I'll do, my goal is, given our time, is I think I'll just take up the question, uh, you know, is Jesus the only way? We'll do that today. And then we'll uh, start afresh on Monday with the problem of hell. And I'll give you sort of a, we'll map out all the different systems theologically that I think will be really helpful for you. And then we'll try to get back on track sometime in the middle of next week. So, okay. Um, it, how would you respond to the claim that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. This is, I think, the, the objection that I hear probably the most on campus is, you mean to tell me that Christianity and Jesus is the only way to heaven? You know, what about my good Hindu friend? You, you mean to tell me he's going to hell? How, do you, how would you respond to that? What would you guys say? Okay. I didn't say it, Jesus did. Okay, good. <laughs> There's probably a gentler way, but um, yeah, sometimes I do say things like, you know, I'm sorry, your argument isn't with me, it's with scripture, or some, you know, something like that, um, but that's what you meant. Good. What else? Yeah. Good. Okay, that's, a, that's another great way. Good. And it shifts the onus, again, to where it ought to be, right? Yeah. Good. Okay, so this question, is Jesus the only way? is sometimes asked, it's asked in two different ways, and so let me kind of map that out for you. Um, so two ways the question is asked. And I hear both of these, um, you know, I hear both of these all the time. The first one we're going to call the doctrinal question. So one way this, this question of religious pluralism, exclusivism comes up is this. Is Christianity true and all others false? And let's call that the doctrinal question. So is Christianity true and all others false? And if you answer, let's call that question one. If you answer yes to that, you're what's called a doctrinal exclusivist. You think there's one, one true religion. Now there's a second way that it's asked, and, and that's the question, is Jesus the only savior? And we're gonna call that the soteriological question. Soteriology is, um, it's that theological term for the study of salvation or you know, how God saves us, that's the, the discipline of soteriology. So we'll call it the soteriological question. And that's the question, is Jesus the only savior? And if you answer yes to that question, well, then you are a soteriological exclusivist. Is Jesus, I think it's on the board, is Jesus the only savior? That's the soteriological question. So, okay, so there's two versions of this question. We're engaging this defeater belief about religion and the exclusivity of Christianity. Now, here's the thing. If you are a doctrinal exclusivist, here's the charge. The charge that people are going to give to you is that you are intellectually deficient. You mean to tell me that your religion is the one true one in the face of all the religions? That's just, you know, how could you possibly say that? You're just intellectually deficient. Here, the charge that's given is that you're morally deficient. How arrogant of you to say that Jesus is the only way and everybody else goes to hell. So that's, that, that charge is that you're morally deficient. You're arrogant in asserting that there's only one way to heaven. Okay? So what I want to do, for, I, I think for the rest of our time today, is we'll just walk through each of these. How do we respond to this question, the question that uh, Christianity is, is true and all others are false, and then we'll walk through this question, the question, is Jesus the only Savior? Okay, are we good so far? Okay, so let's look at the first one. And this, uh, to get us going, you guys, you read a little bit about it. Remember the parable that's always sort of brought up of the blind man and the elephant. Keller talked about that a little bit. 
Um, this is a parable where it's, it goes something like this. Uh, several blind man, men come upon an element, elephant, and the first blind man reaches out and touches the elephant's trunk and says, you know, this creature is long and, and flexible like a snake. And then another one uh, grabs a leg and says, no, it's, it's thick and round like a tree. And then another one sort of pats the side of the elephant and says something like, no, it's large and flat. And each blind man can only feel a part of the elephant. And no one can envision the entire elephant. And so this is the parable. The parable goes like this. In the same way, uh, it's argued that religions, that, that each of the re religions grasps a part of the truth. But no religion gra grasps all of the truth. And we're all just sort of blind and we're feeling our way in the dark. And we're doing the best we can, just like the blind men who are feeling around with the elephant. Okay, so you've heard this before, maybe. How do you guys respond to this? What do you, what do you say to the parable of the blind man and the elephant? Ray. Somebody has to be able to see the entire elephant to even know what you're talking about. Okay, good. Yeah, that was what Keller said, is, you know, this assumes, <laughs> no, I mean, that's good. It, this, is, this assumes that uh, there's some vantage point that you stand on that, where you can see the whole of reality, that you can see all of reality. That was the point that was really good. Yeah. Right. Because you have it, it's the like it. Okay, yeah. Excellent. Um, any, any other ways that we could respond to this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the elephant can't talk. That's right. So maybe if there's a revelation, we could, we could step beyond that blindness. Good. Okay, that, act, that works. Yeah, Scott. <laughs> Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, I think these are all great. Uh, the, the, the parable breaks down in so many ways. Here, here's another way that it, it breaks down. Um, and these, if, as you think about these, these are pretty obvious. When you say that God is personal, are you saying that about part of God or all of the whole of God? And the answer is the whole. <laughs> yeah, when you describe God as personal, this is something true of God. God on the, as the whole. It's not something that's, that's true of God as, as a part, where maybe there's another part of God that's non-personal. These are, these are the kind of things that are true of the whole, the whole being or the whole entity. God is either personal or non-personal. And so, um, yeah, the, the uh, illustration just breaks down in a whole host of ways. And that actually gets to the fundamental problem with examples like this and with the doctrinal version of this question. And here's the fundamental problem. It's, uh, so here's what you do. Here, here's how you respond to it. If somebody says, you know, you think that uh, Christianity is the one true religion, or probably the more popular way that that's expressed is, um, you know, don't all religions lead to God? Or aren't they just different paths to the same God or something like that? Um, here's how I usually answer the question is, is you separate the emotional issue, because it sounds emotional if you put it this way. You mean that my good friend is going to hell because he doesn't believe in Christ. That's, that's emotional. But for now, you separate it, at least for the doctrinal version. And you just say, look, let's just look at it logically. And logically, you've got this thing called the law of non-contradiction. And all the law of non-contradiction contradiction says is that two contradictory claims cannot be true at the same time in the same sense. So two contradictory claims cannot be true at the same time in the same sense. It, you cannot be both A and not A. Or I cannot be both talking to you here and not talking to you now because I'm in a safari in Africa. They both can't be true at the same time. It's fundamental law of logic. Um, Aristotle discovered it or talked about it at least, but you know we all are aware of it. Okay. Oh yeah. Here's some here's some exercises. Let's see if you guys can pick these up. Which of the following is contradictory? Is that a contradiction? Yes. My wife is beautiful. There's my wife, by the way, right there. She, sh she showed up today, and I'm a stud. Hi, Ethel. Sorry. <laughs> so, contradiction? No. I'll answer that for you. <laughs> I was going to help you out on that one. Um, Jesus is God. Jesus is not God. It's a contradiction, right? But notice, Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully man. We talked about that earlier. Contradiction? There's no explicit contradiction. I am here. I am not here. Contradiction? I'm in Africa and the Pope is Catholic. No contradiction. Religious pluralism is true. Christianity is true. There is a contradiction there, right? Because Christianity will claim to be the truth. 
And as we'll see, religious pluralism claims to be that there's many truths. Okay, so you start with this fundamental law of logic, and then you just apply it to the question of religions. And so here's how I actually, I've walked it out like on a napkin a lot of times with students is, um, let's just, just do this. Say, let's pick all the religions and let's pick a topic, uh, for example, what happens after you die. And then you can just kind of list them. You can say, okay, let's pick Christianity, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, uh, Buddhism, uh -oh, atheism, and then you just ask this question, okay, what do each of these religions say about the afterlife, for example? And you can kind of list it. You've got, for Christianity, you've got Jesus, and you've got a heaven and a hell, uh, based on what you do with Jesus, something basic like that. Judaism, you've got kind of a paradise, it's kind of similar, paradise and a shul, uh, but then you've got the, the law of Moses, For Hinduism, uh, you've got reincarnation, you've got karma, and so on. For Islam, you've got a heaven and a hell, but you've got now the five pillars that you need to follow. For Buddhism, you, you've got nirvana and uh, the extinguishment of self. Atheism, no afterlife, your warm food, etc. Uh, you just die, that's it. Okay, so you kind of list it out like that or, or you know, just give the basics. And then, you just, and then you just apply the law of non-contradiction to this list. And the question is, well notice, they, they all contradict each other, so can they all be true? No, they can't all be true because they contradict each other, these sort of fundamental points of doctrine. And so here's the thing, at most, only one can be true. That's just a point of logic. They could actually all be false. You can maybe add something else. Maybe you could add religious pluralism here but then that would just be another option. But they can't all be true because of the law of non-contradiction. And what that does as you engage in this discussion is it moves it off of this sort of logical point that all religions lead to God, and it moves it to the evidence. Because then you say, well, which of these religions has the most evidence for its truth? Because only one can be true at most, given you know, just this law of logic. And what I do at that point is then you just move right to the resurrection and say, well, you know, Christianity's it's historical, it makes this historical claim that Jesus actually rose from the dead, and that's a great place to start. And so that's, that's sort of the standard way that I would engage um, this question when people, or the doctrinal version of the question when people bring it up. Okay? Well, because um, when you show that they can't all be true, which is kind of the assumption behind that this, this uh, doctrinal version, you know, all religions are true. When you show that they can't all be true, well then you move the next, the issue to, well then, if they can't all be true, which one has the most evidence for, for it? You know, which one seems to, to, to be um, grounded in, in, in evidence? And I would go right to the resurrection because it's historical, um, and of course, if, you know, if the resurrection didn't happen, Christianity is false. So it's kind of like our key claim. So, okay, other questions? Yeah, Donna. It's exclusivistic as well. So, Judaism, Christianity, Islam are the ones that, that claim to have all one way? Well, uh, you know, Judaism's uh, not so concerned often with belief, it's more concerned with practice. And so, they wouldn't, they wouldn't even think that's kind of the weird way to state, state the issue, I think. Um, but even that is different than Christianity and Islam. So, they can't all be, you know, those ways of looking at the world can't all be right. In fact, two of them have to be. At least two of them are false. So, okay. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah. Does anyone ever say, well, those all can be true because karma can exist at the same time and heaven does? Uh, does anyone ever try to say that? Um, I mean, if let's just say if they did, what what could we say back to that? That's a, what, what would be. So let's let's tease that out. Well, they could all be true because. Karma and heaven can exist at the same time. Well, I can see him saying like the same thing. I've got a personal view, but if other yeah. I, I mean, I'm just trying to think of like. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember having a conversation with a student. He's like, bro, that's great. You know, if Christianity is true for you, that's great, bro. But Buddhism is true for me, and that's what I believe. And you know, I'm just sitting there, kind of shaking my head, um, because the the assumption behind that that truth is you know relative to the person. And we'll spend some time talking about that on. Um, 
hopefully Monday. But that's just, that's just a bankrupt way of thinking about truth um, in general. So it's not the case that something's true for you but false for me. That's just, that's just not, that's really unworkable and I'll show you in detail on Monday. <laughs> so does that get to the, what your worry is or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you're doing is you're trying to say, well, maybe it's this view, the view that all these religions can be true at the same time. That's called religious pluralism. And we're going to look at that in a, little, in a minute. And so, but, but that claim needs to be evaluated right with everything else. So if that's, if that's the case, well, okay, maybe that's true, but let's, get, let's look at the evidence for it. And as we'll see, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a bankrupt position, too. Okay. Uh, let's see here, there's one more issue on this and then I want to move off of this. Uh, there's this issue of tolerance. So this is the thing that comes up, you know, so often as well is, oh, okay, you know, you think that there's this one truth and you're just not being tolerant. You know, how dare you say that, that Christianity is the only truth. And I guess what I would want to say there is that when someone says you're being intolerant um, because you think there's only one religion, I, I would say they're, they're they're foisting on you a false dichotomy, and the false dichotomy is something like this. Uh, either I accept uncritically everything, or you're a narrow-minded bigot. You know, there's this kind of this false dichotomy. Either, either you accept everybody, or if you don't, well then you're just narrow-minded and you're a bigot. And there's kind of, what's that? Yeah, which is, yeah, not very tolerant view. Um, and what's interesting is that we'll see in a moment, those who say those kinds of things are actually being quite arrogant and intolerant themselves in, hoist, in foisting those claims on you. And so I think more appropriate would be this posture that I love, uh, Spud, brought it, Spud brought it up as well. He talked about humility. Um, I've talked about theological modesty. Well, I think our posture should be one of intellectual humility. Um, that we should say something like this. Look, I think that this is true. I think I have good reasons for it to be true, uh, but I could be wrong. And that, that's a posture that I think is kind of that third way here that's really helpful. In fact, Peter Craved, he talks about how we should be, um, He's a philosopher, and he says that we should be egalitarian towards each other, but elitist with our ideas. And he said that's tolerance, that we be egalitarian towards each other, but elitist with our ideas. Because of course you think that you have right beliefs, and you're going to defend those beliefs. And you could be wrong, but you wouldn't believe it if you didn't think it was true. So be elitist with your beliefs, argue for them, but have this posture of, you know, I could be wrong. But let's uh, move on now to the next version, the soteriological question. Is Jesus really the only Savior? And here, there's three uh, main qu answers to this, this question as well. Okay, so. So one answer to this question, is Jesus the only Savior, is no. And that would be your religious pluralists. So we'll talk about them. That would be this category that you were asking about earlier. You know, maybe they're all saviors. So one answer is no. Well, if you say that, we're, you're going to be a religious pluralist. Another answer to this question, is Jesus the only savior, is yes, but, dot, dot, dot. And so you're going to kind of qualify it. Well, yeah, he is the only savior, but, and then you're going to give some story. And that's going to be your uh, inclusivist. And there are people that are inclusivists. And I'll mention some in a minute. And then there's the people that say yes, period. That would be your third option. And that would be your exclusivist. And so what I want to do is basically just give you reasons to, uh, well, reasons why we ought to be exclusivists. And, and basically, um, that Jesus is, in fact, the only way. And I think we have good warrant from scripture. I think we have good warrant from history. I think we have good warrant philosophically to be exclusivists. And so if that's the case, well, then we need to understand what's going on when people say Jesus isn't the only savior. In fact, there's many, which would be your pluralist, and, the, and those who qualify it here. And so, okay. Let's look through the first option there, the no option, uh, the religious pluralism. And this is interesting. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed in the On Guard book, that you're reading today, um, one of Bill's two PhDs, he got two, uh, was under a guy named John Hick. And John Hick was, it was an, a leading theologian, leading philosopher, and best known defender of religious pluralism, actually. 
And so John Hick, early on, he identified himself as an evangelical Christian. He talks, um, he talks about how he used to go share the gospel tract uh, at the train station in London where he grew up. And, and uh, so he was an evangelical Christian. He, and what happens is he, uh, he became a professor and he began to study uh, relig- uh, people who followed other religions, people of other, other faith traditions. And he noticed two things. Uh, he noticed first that followers of other faiths were just as saintly as Christians, and perhaps even more so than Christians often. And this was puzzling to him. And the second thing that he noticed was adherents of other religions seemed to have a genuine religious experience. And he was puzzled by that. Because if Christianity is true, well then you should only have true vertical religious experiences within Christianity, but it seemed that everybody was having true uh, religious experience of the divine. And so he was puzzled with this. And so he talks about how this led him to kind of this dilemma. And the dilemma for him then was he could either affirm uh, the exclusivity of his own religion and say to all these other friends that he had that they're false. So that was one option he felt like he could do. Or he could argue that strictly speaking, all religions are mistaken, uh, but that each point to the same ultimate reality. And he didn't feel like he could do that first one because remember then he would be uh, arrogant. He would be morally deficient. He didn't feel like he could say that his religion is true in the face of all the saintliness and the, the religious experience of all these other people. And so he opted for that second option, which again was to argue that, strictly speaking, all religions are mistaken, but they each point to this ultimate you know, reality, which is a god. So, that's, so that became religious pluralism. And so really, you know, 1970s uh, was when this became, I don't know, codified through his, his, um, his writings and things like that. And so what is religious pluralism? Let me, let me summarize just a bit, and you've, I see this on your structured notes, you've got four things uh, to note about it. Let me just briefly walk through each one. So according to religious pluralism, uh, number one, and this is all from John Hick, I don't know how much of this you really come into contact with on campus or in your context, so I won't spend a lot of time with it. Um, number one, each religion is a response to the same thing. And by so what he means is that each, he calls them the axial religions. Think of this, the big religions, kind of the ones we wrote out on the board. He says that all of those are responses to the same uh, underlying thing, which he calls uh, the real. That's his, that's his God term, is the real. So all the religions are worshiping in their own sort of tradition, uh, the real. And, and uh, that's, that's it. Um, second thing he says... Each religion has its own phenomenal experience of the real. So you, as Christians, experience the real as personal. Uh, Hindus experience the real as impersonal, and so on. So you each have your own uh, direct, or or you each have your own experience of the real, but no one directly experiences the real in and and of itself. Uh, Third, each religion is literally false, but practically true. Yeah, that's, that was that, you know, that second option that he felt he had to go to. And what he means by this, if you read it, he says, each religion is useful for self-transformation um, from self-centeredness to reality-centered saints. And so that's, the, that's, the, that's why religions are useful, because they, they help you not to be self-centered, but they help you to focus on you know, reality. And they, they have this moral transformation that, that takes place, even though the doctrines of each religion are, strictly speaking, false. So you might ask yourself, how, how is this sounding as, in terms of an attractive view? And then th- uh, fourth, each religion, religion is equally valid, and by that he means e- equally useful. So all of the axial religions are equally useful. So if you want to be, and I wish we did have time to see this Dalai Lama video, because he basically says, look, you, know, you don't, you don't uh, use the same medicine for... Uh, different diseases, so pick, pick whatever medicine works for you, pick whatever religion works for you. And that's kind of the idea here between religious, between, uh, with religious pluralism. Okay, um, even with that, and I haven't said a lot, do you guys have any pushback on this that you might, that any red flags that come to mind, things that you would want to push back on with this view? Yeah. Uh, those who follow the Christian uh, tradition, yes. Like John Hick, to the day he died, considered himself a Christian. Mm-hmm. 
but not liter but it wasn't literally true, of course, all the doctrines of the Bible. He just chose his that was his tradition. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you write, there's a Four Views book. You know how there's all these Four Views books? There's one on Four Views on um, Religious Exclusivity or something like that, and John Hick writes this chapter on pluralism, where, where he actually shares his story, which is really um, interesting. But yeah, he considered himself a Christian until the day he died. Yeah, Gabe? If something is invalid, then that, that lends itself to an interesting conception of what is usual. Okay. Yeah, as long as it's useful for moral transformation. Yep, and that's and that becomes kind of right exactly. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, well, that would be one of the problems. Is that uh, so? He kind of he includes the seven axial religions, the so-called big ones, the world religions. But like, why why just include those? Why not Satanism or why not? I don't know, some branch Davidians and Apple's Gates and all these things. So, so it actually sounds rather ad hoc or arbitrary um, that he, he just picked the big ones, you know. So that would be a problem with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Could you summarize it as the ends justify the means? Okay. Yeah, what do you mean in terms of moral like transformation? Ends, we want everybody to be nice to each other and be good yeah. people and whatever it takes to get there, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, it's not very, so there's some things that I kind of am skipping over, but this whole concept of the real is interesting because he actually, um, he's borrowing from Kant, and Kant made this distinction between um, reality in itself and the way you experience reality, so the noumena and the phenomena. If you've heard these terms, it's okay if you haven't, but these are from Kant. So he took, that, he took Kant's epistemology and applied it to theology here. And so he talked about the real in itself versus the real in your experience, and so you have a Christian experience of the real and others have a Buddhist experience of the real. But he said you couldn't ascribe any actual properties to the real in, it, in itself. But then he ends up ascribing all these properties to the real, such as the real is the ground of our experience, religious experience. Well, that's, that's something that you're saying about the real in and of itself, and so on. And so, so in, in a, most scholars would say who think about this, I should say philosophers who, who have engaged this, they'd say, well, there's, it's self-contradictory. And anything, of course, that's self-contradictory is false. And so that would be one problem um, with this. But even beyond that kind of stuff, just if you think about it, what Hick is proposing is a radical distortion of each of these religions' own views on the doctrine and practice, right? It's a radical distortion of what you think you are doing when you follow Christ and when you engage in reading of your scripture. And so too for Islam and Judaism and Buddhism. And so it's a radical distortion would be the first thing. And the second thing to just note is, does he avoid the charge of being arrogant? What is he saying here? He's saying this is the truth that you're all wrong, and that this is the one way of all the world religions, this is the true one. But that's, I mean, that's the height of arrogance, if, because there's only just like a very few amount of people that actually think that religious pluralism is true, compared to all the other world religions. And so really, um, he doesn't avoid the main thing that he was hoping to avoid, which is this charge of arrogance. So, Okay, so I would say, I would just say for a whole host of reasons, that's probably not the way we ought to go. Ray. How does he get around the logical implications of this absolutely illogical statement, literally false but practically true. That's got to be some kind of semantic meaning. Well, you just read, you, you use a different um, concept of what truth is. So truth is no longer correspondence to reality. Now truth is a pragmatic view of truth. So whatever is true is whatever works for you. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting way to characterize it. I kind of like that. Yeah. If you like cotton candy, I happen to hate it, but our sons <laughs> like cotton candy. Um, yeah, so you, you're using a, I'm glad you pointed that out. So they're using a, a non-intuitive sense of truth. Uh, it's called the pragmatic theory of truth. Whatever works is true for you. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on from that one. Uh, you might see it sort of popularly uh, couched, but again, just point to these kind of logical problems, and, and that should be enough for that. But the one that I think is really interesting for our purposes is the second one uh, that of late is becoming a little more popular, the so-called Christian inclusivists. And here, look at the distinction on your handout. 
uh, between, you see on there, uh, these words, ontological necessity and epistemological necessity. And so, <laughs> inclusivism. Inclusivism is the view, uh, which is an increasingly popular view held by Christians such as Clark Pinnock, who just passed away. This is a big name in uh, evangelical theology, though. Clark Pinnock. Uh, John Sanders is another one that would be an inclusivist. A, a Catholic theologian, Karl Rahner, if you've heard of, of that name. These would be people who are Christian in inclusivists. And then to, to understand what it is, just look at the distinction between those two phrases. The ontological necessity of Christ's work as Redeemer and the epistemological necessity of Christ's work as Redeemer. So here's what the inclusivists would say. They would say that Christ is ontologically necessary for salvation, but not epistemologically necessary. So, and let me just say that another way, if that, so that may, makes some sense. So in other words, Christ's saving work on the cross is the mechanism of personal salvation. That's the first part, that Christ is ontologically necessary. The saving work on the cross is the mechanism of personal salvation, but people can be saved based on the sincerity to one's faith, regardless of the object of that faith. That's the second part. It's not epistemologically necessary to claim to have belief in Christ. Okay, the second part? I'll say the whole thing. Uh, in other words, Christ's saving work on the cross is the mechanism for personal salvation, but people can be saved based on their sincerity to one's faith, regardless of the object of that faith. Did to, did yeah, Corey? Did, I'm, I'm wondering if C.S. Lewis agreed with that, because he has this character in the last battle. Yeah. He's in heaven. Yeah. And he's always stood up and he was so sincere mm -hmm. in his own faith that God took it for himself. Yeah. And then, it, and then William Lane Craig almost seems to mm -hmm. have something similar in heaven. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It, it comes up every time, C.S. Lewis, and, and then now that we're using this book, the, the little the paragraph where Bill seems to hint that way too. Yeah, so I, I've wondered about the scene in The Last Battle, if you're not familiar with it. It's, I forget the name of the soldier, virtuous man though, um, from Tash or whatever. And, uh, and so Lewis seems to uh, hint that this soldier that wasn't a follower of Aslan eventually gets to the heaven, you know, Narnia's version of heaven. And so I've wondered the same, exact same thing. You know, does that mean that Lewis was an inclusivist? So I actually asked Jerry Root, who is a C.S. Lewis scholar, that question. And he said, no, he's not an inclusivist, but I wish I could tell you why. I can't remember the details. Um, <laughs> and so you're just going to have to take his word for it. So I, so I don't know. I, I, had the same, I had the same wondering, but a C.S. Lewis scholar um, who teaches at Wheaton said, no, it was something else that's going on there. I don't remember what it was. Um, but I will say that Brian McLaren, in his book, Generous Orthodoxy, if you've read that or looked at that, he uses that same passage from Lewis in The Last Battle to argue that we ought to be inclusivist. And so it's very easy to read it that way, for sure. Yeah, and then there, I, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what page is that again? I read it this morning again. 274. Yeah, I mean, I just wrote in the, my thing, not so sure on that. This would be one of the... I, I, read that, uh, I read that second paragraph under the section, Is the Problem lack, a Lack of Information? I do read that as exactly what I just said. You know, but I know that Bill's not an inclusivist. He's very clearly an exclusivist. Yeah, that's right. So uh, yeah, I would say two things. I'd say later on he says there is this possibility, but we should be dim. Like we should. Uh, I mean, it's on the next page, two seventy-five. Um, yeah, there's this possibility, but we should, there's little ground for optimism about there being many people, if any. So he says that, but number two, if you read on in the chapter, he gets his actual view. He, he couches it as a possibly true view, where um, there will in fact be nobody who is saved, I'm sorry, there'll be nobody who isn't saved that would have been saved if they had heard the gospel. So his actual view is everybody that would be saved will be saved, and they'll have an opportunity to hear the gospel itself. And so... So that's why he's actually an exclusivist. But here you're right. It does. I read that, and it, it sounded a lot like what I'm, I'm saying here. Yeah. Yeah. A distinction with the inclusive, inclusivist view. Are they thinking that what, what merits salvation is the sincerity of belief? 
Yeah. Right. Or is it a sincerity of belief in whatever you believe? I really think it's, as far as I've understood and read inclusivists, I think it's the former. It's the sincerity of belief. Um, because Karl Rahner says you can actually, he actually says that there's anonymous Christians, you know, Buddhists or whoever, that as long as they're faithfully following their own doctrine, um, that they're good, they're Christians. And so I think it's, yeah, I don't think it's a Job or the Melchizedek thing. I think it's just be sincere. Yeah, um, okay, that's good. Yeah, so I don't know the last battle thing. It's a really interesting. Uh, and then even the Bill comment in the chapter. Um, yeah, Call Runner, anonymous Christians, people saved by Christ without ever having heard the name of Christ or who, are, who actively believe in Christ. So that would be the inclusivist view. There was this thing, now that we're talking about it, on page 274, 275, um, the genuine offer uh, you know, the question of general revelation. There's this question about general revelation. What does that do? And so Bill, as you read on page 274, 275, he talks about how Romans 2.7, uh, which says, to those who patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will be given eternal life. Bill says that's a genuine offer of salvation, but then he kind of qualifies it with, but you shouldn't uh, expect that anybody will actually be saved that way. I mean, you should know there's other views on that. I think you probably do know. Uh, probably the more traditional view would be something like, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't ho offer any hope of salvation through general re revelation. All, the, all general revelation accomplishes is um, helping you to be con rightly condemned, you know, in, in the face of your Savior. And that's why we need the special revelation of Christ. And so there's kind of these two views out there. Um, Bill's would certainly be within, I mean, that's certainly a normal evangelical view out there, but there's also this other view as well. So, okay. Yeah, Ray. Yeah, not to digress on mm -hmm. this, but the whole area and the issue in the Middle East is we ran into it all the time. People would have dreams and visions mm -hmm. that are way outside our experience in right. the Western world. Yeah. Put a different context to it, but those dreams and visions were always very specific. Mm -hmm. The person always had a dream or a vision of Christ, and he was giving them that offer. Of That's right. And so I wonder if they're not mixing some of that in, trying to be inclusive enough to cover that, but it doesn't need to be covered. Yeah. I mean, if that's the case, that's fine. That's still exclusivism. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. You will hear wonderful stories like that all the time. Yeah. Okay. So should we be inclusivists or should we be exclusivists? And here's some reasons to think, you know, that we ought to be exclusivists. And uh, I know these are things that we're all familiar with. I mean, we're all crew staff. And so I think that we, we know these things. But uh, I would say that, um, well, oh, oh, first thing to say, the exclusivist basically affirms the ontological necessity and the epistemological necessity uh, for, that is necessary for salvation. So not only is Christ the mechanism and Christ's atonement the mechanism for our salvation, but we need to, as Romans 10, 9 would say, you know, we need to believe with our hearts and confess with our lips that Christ is Lord. We need to have actual epistemic belief that Jesus is, in fact, who he claims to be and he saves us and things like that. And there's lots of things, uh, examples in, in Scripture, and I've just noted them on your handout. You guys know John 3.16 uh, affirms that those who believe in Jesus have eternal life and those who disbelieve don't. John 4.14.6, 4, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, Acts 4.12, same thing, and, and more. So we have lots of Scripture uh, that, that affirm uh, the exclusivity of Christ. And you guys know these passages. Uh, and so I'll just move off that. There's an interesting theological consideration, though, and this is what, I, what you see up on the screen here. This logical connection, I find this really interesting. There's actually a, a logical connection between the deity of Christ and the doctrine of ex the exclusivity of Christ for salvation. And here's the logical connection. It starts like this. So it, it, it begins with the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. And so if we believe that Jesus is God, well, then it follows that Christianity alone was founded by God in person. Just think about that. If Jesus is God, God sent his son incarnate into the world. Well, it follows that Christianity alone was founded by God in person. From there it follows that God wants all people to be related to him through the religion that he formed, since God founded it. From there it follows the, con the, the final conclusion, well, there's no salvation outside Christianity. That is, 
uh, Christianity exclusively is true. And what's interesting about this progression is that John Hick, remember John Hick, the religious pluralist? Well, he recognized this. And so what does he deny? Point number one, the deity of Christ. So he actually denied the deity of Christ. In 1997, he wrote a book called The Myth of God Incarnate. When he talks about how uh, uh, the belief in Jesus was an early fabrication of the church. And so he sees the logical connection. And you just need to know that it's there between the deity of Christ and the exclusivity of Christianity. Okay? Any thoughts, comments on that? It's pretty cool. And <laughs> your Milton's thinking over there. Uh, and the last thing, which I'll just scan over on your, on your structure notes, we've got philosophical, historical considerations. We'll talk about these next week. We're going we're gonna to show that there's good reason to think that theism is true uh, and that God exists, and not just God in general, but the God of theism. And we'll look at that uh, Tuesday, maybe. And then we have good reason to think that the Bible is trustworthy. In fact, the very Word of God. And we'll look at that next week. And if that is the case... Well, then, we're, then we have good reasons to think that exclusivity, the exclusivity of Christ is true as well. Okay? Yeah? How could you not deny Islam saying, like, Muhammad was directly inspired by an angel of God? Like, so deny Jesus that, you might not lie. Like, how would you think? It's like, Muhammad was directly inspired by an angel of God, therefore, Islam was founded by God, who's speaking directly to us, therefore, he wants us to Mm-hmm. Um, on the face of it, that sounds like a good parallel argument to this one. And then you just look at that first premise again and ask for the veridity, the, uh, the truthfulness of it. Um, and that's where I would look, you know. Angel of God, is that true? You know, or could it have been, is there some other explanation? Yeah. Is, that, is that helpful? I mean, I would look at the first premise. I think that is a good parallel argument. But is that first premise as secure as this first premise? True. Well, that, that's fair enough, but in reality, is it fair? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's good. Yeah, Corey. Mm-hmm. I just have a comment. It just seems to me like you sharing the gospel that I just try and avoid this issue. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we've created this presentation of the four laws where one quarter of the God we're presenting is exclusive. Mm-hmm. And that, that I don't think that's a fair representation of who he is. If you look at the like everything Jesus said and everything God did in the Old Testament, he's so incredibly inclusive that I I'm just wondering why we're not gearing ourselves more towards uh, representing him as an inclusive God more and using more inclusive language. Because I just feel like I don't even like to know really use the four laws. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Number two and three here. Um, He's the only way. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I hear all that, but I, I feel like the, some of the passages, like even in the four laws the, the, uh, that are in here, John 3.16, John 14.6, those are pretty clear. And if Christ is who he claims to be, well, and he backs it up through the resurrection, well, then, he has some, then, then we can know that he's speaking the truth on these things, and so we're kind of bound to that, you know? Yeah, now, yeah I believe they're true. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why would I expect someone who hasn't had the years that I've had understanding of character and sacrifice yeah. to be able to deal with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, no, that's fair. I think you could. So, if our assumption is that Jesus is our greatest need, Jesus is the only hope, Jesus is the only hope of forgiveness of sin, 
we don't need to couch it in the language of exclusivism, but we do need to point them to Christ somehow. And it, I mean, if you, I think if you're saying it's just where do we bring up those kind of, that kind of language, well, yeah, figure out some other way that's gentler. That's fine. Um, but I guess we're thinking about the question, you know, the question often is phrased like this. Is he really the only way? And we do, there is an answer to that question. And it's one of those three options, you know. Yeah. And so you, we can still couch it in our dialectic gently. And I think that's okay. And maybe not even bring it up if it's not, and I wouldn't even bring it up if it's not an issue. Um, just often it, often it is. So, yeah. So let me pray for us and we can all go. So, uh, Jesus, thank you so much for Spud coming in today and just uh, so good to hear from him and his perspective on how to engage um, the community of the GLBTQ. And I uh, pray that you'd help us to learn how to do that. Uh, in a way that's honoring to you and loving and all that good stuff. And so I just thank you for that. Thank you for this class. And Lord, I know we've worked hard this week. We've read a lot. We've um, engaged a lot in discussion. And Lord, I pray that you would just help us to relax this weekend and enjoy your creation, enjoy each other, and enjoy time with you. So I pray that you keep us safe, and we look forward to being back together on Monday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this question of divine sovereignty Divine foreknowledge and human freedom. This is like the age-old conundrum that, you, that everybody wrestles with, right? For the last 2,000 years in history, we've been trying to make sense of that. And so today, what I want to do right now is give you a framework for how to think about that. Um, and and I, I know I don't, I'm not the clearest writer, but this says divine sovereignty, divine foreknowledge, and human freedom. And let me give you the categories. Um, this is kind of just a broad framework of how to think about this, and then maybe you'll be able to locate yourself and your own thinking theologically within this. So on one side here, and this will make sense as I go into it, but here we've got Calvinism. Sometimes it's called Augustinianism. And actually, you could sometimes also call it Thomism, if you're a Catholic type of uh, Thomism. Thomism. So the Calvinistic Reformed view uh, says this, and this will make sense now as I continue on. Uh, it, it holds to a very high degree of divine control. Let's just call it high. God controls a lot. In fact, I think I've mentioned the term, under Calvinism, God exercises what's called meticulous providence. So you have this famous... Uh, statement by a guy named Abraham Kuyper, who was a Dutch reform thinker. He said that there's not one square inch of reality in which Christ does not cry, mine. So that would be an example of meticulous providence, that God is in, he's in control of every detail of your lives. He's in control of every single detail of everything that goes on. There's no place for chance in a world controlled by God in that way. Okay? We good? All right, does God have divine foreknowledge under Calvinism? And the answer is yes, he does. And the reason why, let's just say in virtue, um, probably a better way, he has it because God preordains everything. So he knows the future because he determines the whole future. It's all his. He's willed everything that's going to take place. So, so of course he knows it because he willed the whole, the whole thing. Okay? Now what view of human freedom do we have if we're Calvinist, uh, our, our Augustinians, Thomists? Well, we, we hold a view of freedom called compatibilism. And I know this is a philosophical word, but here's what compatibilism is. Can you see that? Sorry. Um, compatibilism is just the view that being determined is compatible with being free. So you can, you can, see, you can see it there. Compatible, uh, human freedom is compatible with being free. Sometimes it's called uh, one-way freedom, and here would be an example. So say you have you know, three options before you, you know, and, and you, 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 you could choose all three. Well, under... Um, Compatibilism, while you, while you have three options before you, you will always only do one of those. Now, you want to do this one, and you freely do it, but in fact, this is the only one you could do because you were determined uh, to do so, in this case, by God. So this is a kind of what's called theological determinism. So God is determining your actions, your desires, and so on, but that's compatible with you being free. 
Okay, sometimes called one-way freedom as well. Okay, any questions so far? This will make sense as I contrast it as well. Yeah. Thomism. How's that? Thomism. It seems right, right? Okay. <laughs> all right. No, that's how you spell it. Yeah, spell check that on your Google. So, all right. What's next? So, if we're if we're if we're not going to be Calvinists, well, what are the other options? The next view, I sh let's do it this way. Every other view from here on out is going to hold to a different view of human freedom. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be called libertarianism. Libertarianism. Libertarian freedom. Maybe to be more helpful, it's also called incompatibilism. These are just fancy names for... I mean, it's technically called libertarian freedom. It's also called incompatibilistic freedom. But you can see with that second way that I described it, you can maybe get a, um, an idea of what it is. The libertarian view says being free is not compatible with being determined. Right? So you're not free if you're determined. Compatibilism says, yeah, you are. So what's the difference? What is libertarian freedom? Libertarian freedom is uh, the view that your actions are genuinely free actions if they're caused by you and no external force. So that's the distinction. Here you have an external cause that works through you, either theological determinism, which is God working through your desires, or actually there's something called physical determinism, which is the laws of nature and the initial conditions sort of cause you to, you know, to do whatever you do. But here it says, no, you are a self uh, centered, uh, self -cent we are self-centered, but you're self-centered uh, of causal activity. Like you are a first cause of your actions. So when I do this, I'm, I'm a first cause of raising my hand. And there's no, there's no external cause that's working through me to cause me to raise my hand or not, okay? So that's called libertarian freedom. The, the big sort of uh, difference between the two is that there's no external cause that is influencing your decision, okay? Or your, your will to act. So everything outside of Calvinism is going to hold to this libertarian view of freedom. Okay? Sometimes they're, taught, they're called free will uh, theisms. So you can kind of see that this is a watershed issue. Depending on what your view of freedom is, well, you're going to go one way or the other on that. And by the way, what is the biblical view of freedom? Or, uh, let me ask you this. Does the Bible um, presuppose that we're free? Yes. Why? Well, give me, give me some examples. How does the Bible presuppose that you are free? The gospel call demands a response. Okay, yeah. The gospel demands a response. What else? We chose. What's that? Adam and Eve. Sorry. We chose to sin. Okay, the, the Adam and Eve thing. What about this? Are there, are there injunctions? Are there imperatives in Scripture? An imperative is a command? Yeah. yeah. Be holy, whatever. You know, there's lots of them. Paul gives lots of imperatives. Well, that presupposes that we're free in some sense. But here's the thing. What is the biblical view of freedom? This one or that one? Yes. It's silent. It's silent on it. And that it's a philosophical issue. So the Bible is sort of open textured on this issue. And so we need to engage in philosophy uh, because clearly we have freedom, but it's not clear what, what that really means, how, what that amounts to. And so it's actually a philosophical issue. Okay, so say that you don't like compatibilism and you, you want to be a, a libertarian, you want to hold to that view of freedom because you think that's genuine freedom. Well, here's your options. Bill Craig is this next view. It's called Molinism. Now, how many people here have heard of Molinism? Okay, just a couple. My guess is that many of you might even be Molinist without knowing it. Um, what I found, I mean, just, well, what I found is when I went to seminary, uh, all the theologians were Reformed Calvinists, and all the philosophers were Molinists. And I'm like, guys, can you just like talk to each other? What's going on here? How do I make sense of this? And, um, oh, but Bill Craig, what you're reading is a good articulation of the Molinistic view. So here's how it goes. Divine control. Well, it's still high. In fact, under Molinism, we still have meticulous providence. So this is good. Because that seems to, you know, that seems to be the, the comport of Scripture, is that God is meticulous and in control of everything. So you still get that. Does God have divine foreknowledge? Yes, you still get that. But now it's not because God preordains everything. You have uh, divine foreknowledge because God 
knows um, through his, oh, this is a repeat. Let's just say that wasn't going to be a good way. Just say God has innate knowledge of what we will do. So what happens under Molinism, and again, it has, it's a libertarian view of freedom. So this would seem to be good because you have a, a genuine view of freedom that many like, especially philosophers, but you also get meticulous freedom that many of us like, especially as uh, Christians. So it seems to be a good solution. Now, how does it work, though? Well, here, I think I've mentioned this before, God um, exercises his providential control through the divine will. Here, he exercises his providential control through the divine mind or the divine intellect. And what you need to do, and I kind of, Lauren asked a question last week about this, and I gave a really quick answer, but the way that he exercises his providential care uh, through the divine mind is through um, this something called middle knowledge. It's another species of God's knowledge called middle knowledge. Do you want me to keep going, or is that, do you want me to keep explaining that? Yes. Okay. So here's how it works. And again, this is, uh, you could get pretty complicated, but say, you know, here's God before creation. And this is how it works. Before creation, God is, he's surveying all the possible worlds that he might create. So there's possible world one, possible world two, possible world three, on and on and on. Infinities of infinities of possible worlds. And he, this is before he's created any world. And he says, you know, I want to create libertarian free creatures. And so he selects the set of possible worlds where there's libertarian free creatures. Let's just say it's this set right here. You've got other sets of possible worlds where maybe you're compatibilistic creatures. Here are your Martians, here are your Cylons or whatever. But, but he selects the world and he says, I want carbon-based, libertarian-free creatures. And here's the possible worlds where I could do that. Narnia is up here somewhere, Middle Earth up here, something like that. I mean, they're all there. They're all possible, if they are, in fact, possible. Um, and then God says, of these worlds, and again, again there's going to be an infinity of these worlds, right? Because it, but in these worlds, we're all free. So in this world, you freely choose to go to the movies on Friday or something. And in this one, maybe you don't. Maybe you're, in this world, you're in Colorado this week. And in this world, you're, you know, I don't know, living somewhere else and you have a different job. So, he's, so how does he providentially uh, control the world? Well, prior to creation, he surveys all these and he selects the possible world that is going to, be, that is going to accomplish his will and his purpose. And so of all the possible worlds where you are free, he, say he selects this one. And then that one becomes the actual world, the world, in fact, in which we live. But in that world, you are free because you're libertarian free, but God has providentially controlled the world because he selected from all these infinities of infinities of worlds, he selected the one where his will and purposes are accomplished. All right, go. Okay, so, so this is Molinism? Yeah. This is what you just described? Yes. So, so you think the action to choose the correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you mean? Preordaining. So, you get, so, so in the Calvinism, oh, you yeah. yes, because God preordains everything. Right. He, makes, he makes a big list and then preordains the one who chooses. Right. True. So you get this, but you're free in that world. That's the big difference. Because remember, this is a set of all possible worlds where there's libertarian freedom. But he got rid of all the ones where he's made uh, No, they're still there. He, just, he chose not to actualize one of those worlds. He chose not to create that world. Uh, well, it might exist in his mind, but it doesn't exist in reality, correct? Yeah. Keep thinking on it, that's okay. <laughs> Milton. Is this chart someplace? I can actually send you out a spreadsheet that I've, uh, it's just me, but I, I can send you out a spreadsheet on it, yeah. I've got, uh, there's a couple blogs that I can point you to that I've done that also have a lot of this information, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, how would each of these people handle that? They'd both affirm it, no problem. <laughs> so predestination, yeah. You just, ex you just cash it out differently. You know? So predestination here, well, in virtue of God's will. Predestination here, in virtue of God's omniscience. So he predestines you in the sense that he selects the world where you will, do, where you will be here right now asking that question or whatever. So, or you're, that you'll become a Christian or something like that. Yeah, so... so yeah, both would say that they can handle the data of Scripture equally well. 
And in fact, I'll point you, uh, the, here's the thing, when I went to, I mentioned how when I was in seminary, I was like, why don't you guys talk? Um, why do the theologians not talk to the philosophers? And I, I always would ask, can you give me a book that shows theologically how Molinism makes sense, scripturally? And I, I, there was no book, this was 10 years ago or whatever, and you know, there's great uh, systematic books on Reformed theology that show the sort of beauty of that system biblically. And then finally, I was teaching at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary where I taught uh, in Wake Forest the last couple years, and there, for the first time, I met this guy named Ken Keithley. Here is a Molinist theologian who is um, trying to show how Molinism is biblically consistent. And I've, when I read this, I actually found myself just writing in the margin, yes, this is what I've been trying to articulate. Yes, this, this resonates. And so I would, if you're interested in that, I would recommend to you this book. It's called Salvation and Sovereignty, A Molinist Approach uh, by Kenneth Keithley. I'll pass it around. And I've got a blog on my website called Molinism is a Bed of Roses. And if you want to see a little bit about it, you can look at that blog. And you can get the link to the book. So, yeah, I'm not done with the chart. We keep going. Good. Oh, yeah. This is from, this is from a Catholic uh, Counter-Reformation uh, priest, Louis de Molina. So that's who it comes from. Um, yeah, but a lot of evangelical philosophers, especially these days, are all Molinist. Which is, and you know why? It's because they think there's a lot of problems with this view of freedom. Yeah. Well, that's hard because you have Reformed Baptist and you have, um, yeah, so I mean, mostly this would be your Reformed people, Presbyterians. Um, mostly this would be all over, it's kind of like a little less Calvinistic. So like Baptist a lot of times are this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, some Catholics I'm sure would be here too. The next one's Arminianism, and so that would be what, your, wes your um, holiness tradition and all that stuff, Methodist maybe. Should I keep going on the chart? Yeah. Or, uh. So the next view, Arminianism. And just to fill in the chart so you can kind of see where you land on these things. Divine control, let's just say lower, a little lower. Why? Because now we hold to what's called general. God exerts general providence. So, for example, God is concerned with the big picture, but whether or not you have 82 hairs on your head or 182 hairs on your head, he doesn't really care, or something like that. You know, uh, whether or not you had um, Jimmy John's for lunch or you had Qdoba for lunch, he doesn't really care. So that's, that's, that stuff's just sort of irrelevant. So God's orchestrating the big picture stuff, but he's not so concerned about the details. So, so that's why I say a little lower. It's called general providence. In terms of divine foreknowledge, yes. Again, this, this view holds that you have divine, that God has divine foreknowledge. Uh, it's a view called simple foreknowledge. Uh, and at this point, I would refer you to a book um, called Four Views on Divine Foreknowledge. And you can in there read the simple foreknowledge view <clears throat> by a guy named David Hunt, who's a really good thinker on this. Um, and of course, it holds to a libertarian view of freedom. So you can kind of see a shift, especially in, the, in this top category now, uh, as we kind of go down the list here, okay? Arminianism, yeah, was, this would be your holiness tradition, your Methodist, Asbury Seminary, and so on. Maybe Nazarenes, I think, too. Okay? Next one is what? Guesses? This is your open theism. So here, who here has heard of open theism? Okay. Okay, good. So, what is open theism? Somebody tell me. God doesn't know the future. So, open theists are going to deny this right here. And that's why we put that on. Why doesn't God know the future? Do you know? Yeah. Right. So, they say we have libertarian freedom. Uh, and if we have libertarian freedom, even God doesn't know what you're going to do. God is just as surprised if you turn into a wife beater or if you get murdered or raped or whatever. God is just as surprised as we are about that. Because he doesn't have, and here's what he doesn't have knowledge of. He doesn't have knowledge of uh, contingent, free human acts of creatures. That's what's denied to God in, this, in the open theist. So in other words, the future is open. And they base this on 
Um, they actually, uh, that's probably not the main thing that they base it on. Mm -mm. So there's kind of forks in the road to open theism. One fork in the road would be this. Obviously, you can kind of see how the human freedom issue is one path. Um, what are some of the other? The other fork in the road is they actually don't think, and this is more a philosophical thing, but they don't think there's a truth value to the claim that um, I will go see a movie this Friday. There's no truth value to that proposition until I, in fact, do it. And so if there's no truth value to that future tense proposition, well, then even God can't know it because there's nothing to be known. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue related to ontology or metaphysics that, that steers them. So, so the debate is between like this view, who wants to say, no, God still knows that, and this view is whether or not God has knowledge of future free human acts and how, how there can be a truth value for that today. You know, how is it true today that I will go see a movie on Friday when that's something that I will freely choose or not to do on Friday? So, so, Well, uh, I'm not sure what the difference is. Uh, to say that you're libertarianly free doesn't mean that you're autonomous. Uh, there's soft and there's hard versions of libertarianism. And I think it would be a very so-called hard version that, say you're, that says you're completely autonomous in all situations. I think I'm inclined towards what that book really nicely lays out as the soft view of libertarianism. And that just means that you are influenced, uh, your, your character does influence you, but you still can freely choose within that scope of, your, of where your character kind of shapes you. So if I'm a virtuous person, there's things that I actually can't do because I've formed my character in such a way that I won't, say, cheat on my wife or something like that, or lie, you know. Um, but if my character is such that I'm a vicious person or, or you know, have, uh, or whatever, well then there's, there's a range of things that, that, I, that I, I can do. Um, in both cases I'm free, but my character actually influences the range of things that I can freely choose to do. But there's still, but the important thing on libertarianism is that it's me acting and no external force that acts through me. That's the big difference. Okay, yeah, we should keep going. What does an open theist do with prophecy? Great question. What does an open theist do with prophecy? Mangle it. Mangle it? Yeah. <laughs> that is one of the big critiques is how do you square this with scripture and specifically prophecy? Their answer is this. Well, God, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. He's got, he's got omniscience. All, all things that can be known, God knows. He just doesn't know the future because you can't know it. And so probably it's going to happen that way. So, so prophecy is probabilistic claims. Most likely this is going to happen. And that's how they handle it. Now, I'll leave that to you if that's actually a fair representation of prophecy. I don't think it is, but yeah. Lauren? Okay, great. Yeah, that would be, I mean, so there are people... Um, Clark Pinnock, who just died, was an open theist. Uh, John Sanders is writing on that now. There's a book called The God Who Risks, that if you're interested in seeing a biblical case for open theism, he does it. And in fact, in that Four Views book that I mentioned, um, let's see, actually, no. If you go, so I'm, I'm just pointing to, to my blog, because these are places where I've thought about these things. On my blog, there's a book review. Uh, if you go to the articles section, there's a book review of a Four Views on Divine Nature. And one of those, one of those Four Views, so you can get the book title there, but the, the fourth view is this guy, John Sanders, and he does an excellent case of sh showing how this is biblically consistent, or at least I would say the best, the best way to try to defend that biblically would be there. And so there, I have a book that's listed under book reviews that you can check out. It seems like open theism would have a different take on the problem of evil. They do. Yeah, um, it's a problem even for God. So he just, he just he can't handle it. You know, I mean, it's just he's as surprised as you are. You know, so yeah. So in this, so in this one, and maybe this one, I'm not convinced here. There is a place for chance in the world. So Lady Fortune spins the dice in this world, if this is the world we live in, because there is a place for chance in this world. So I say lower still, uh, because God is surprised. The future, future is open. All right, just to complete the chart, so you can kind of get the full thing here. The last one is called process theology. And at this point, we've stepped, I would say from this point on, we've kind of stepped out of, I don't know, orthodoxy or, or whatever, although many people would consider these, this within the realm of uh, orthodox Christianity. Here you've got just say lowest. God, you know, God is changing. Not only is his mind changing, but God's being is changing. So he's just as surprised as you are that with all things that happen. Of course, there's no divine foreknowledge. Uh, yes, we're free in those ways. So, Okay.
I hope this is helpful. I mean, if we had a whole week on divine providence, human freedom, we could drill down on all these, and that would be really fun. Maybe someday we should do a course like that. But, um, but I hope this gives you a framework for the discussion now that we're going to have. Because as you can see, Christians differ. And based on where you are with some of these things, you're going to answer these questions differently. Okay? Ash. Are you saying God changes the eternal ones? Yeah, here. I mean, his being. So this, they talk about, like, yeah, God is changing. God's evolving with us. Uh, God's learning with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. With that said, let's now try to transition to our problem of hell. And again, keep this in the background because this will inform the way we think about it. So down to your handout, uh, or to your course structure notes, uh, the problem of hell. This is Lewis. I love, again, Lewis, this is out of his book, The Problem of Pain. He says, the doctrine of hell is one of the chief grounds on which Christianity is attacked as barbarous and the goodness of God impunged. We are told that it is a detestable doctrine, and indeed, I too detest it from the bottom of my heart, and are reminded of the tragedies in human life which have come from believing it. Of the other tragedies which come from not believing it, we are told less. The problem is not simply that of a God who consigns some of his creatures to final ruin. Christianity, true as always, to the complexities of the real, presents us with something naughtier and more ambiguous. A God so full of mercy that he becomes man and dies by torture, to avert, uh, avert that final ruin from his creatures, and yet, where the heroic remedy fails, seems unwilling or even unable to arrest the ruin of an act of mere power. And here is the real problem. So much mercy, yet still there is hell. So this problem uh, concerns the fate of the unbeliever who dies uh, without accepting Christ. And of course, we talked about last week Christian exclusivism, uh, Christian exclusivism clearly consigns such persons to hell, and the pluralist, if you remember the religious pluralist, and even the inclusivist to some degree, uh, finds that unconscionable. So the question is, well, what is hell? And on your structured notes, we've got, you know, I think I have a quote from Grudem there. This is, a, this is really important. What is the traditional doctrine of hell? Well, I think Wayne Grudem has a good sort of summary statement. Uh, he uses, and all these words are important. He says, hell is a place of eternal, conscious punishment for the wicked. So that's what hell is. It's a place of unending conscious existence. And no one can escape hell once so consigned. Uh, and persons are consigned to hell as punishment. That's important. It's a punishment for living a, self, a life of self-love instead of a life of God-love. And uh, this characterization of hell, you know, it has strong scriptural backing. Think of Matthew 25, uh, verses 41, where Jesus says, of course, do you guys know that Jesus talks about hell? Um, you know, it's one, of, it's one of the things he talks the most about, is hell. And so Matthew 24, 25, verse 41, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then verse 46, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Next bullet point in your structure notes. Dante in the Divine Comedy. Great little piece of uh, literature. The inscription over the entrance of hell. I mean, this is just brilliant. Uh, you know, abandon all hope. All ye who enter here. 2 Corinthians 1.9. There's another verse to write down where it, it talks about this. Uh, it urges that the ultimate everlasting separation from the source of life and hope is what happens when someone is consigned to hell because they're separated from God. 2 Corinthians 1.9 says, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from, the majest, from his majesty and power. So that's 2 Thessalonians 1.9. Thessalonians, Thessalonians. Yeah, sorry. Did I say Corinthians? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. 2 Thessalonians 1.9. Okay, one more bullet point there. This is, I, I really like... Uh, what Keller says in The Reason for God on this question of the fire and the darkness. I don't know if you've ever wondered about this. I've had students ask me about that. You know, how do you make sense of the gnashing of teeth and the fire and the darkness and the outer darkness and, and, and things like that. And, and I think that Keller's right when he says that we understand these things metaphorically. 
I've heard JP teach on this as well. I think he talks about this in uh, The Case for Faith, which is one of those least durable things that he does. JP Moreland talks about hell in there, the problem of hell. But, but I love what Kelly says. He says, fire disin or Keller said, he says, fire disintegrates. And if these images were literal, they would cancel each other out. So fire and darkness are figurative or metaphorical expressions of disintegration, of isolation, and the experience of loss. And I think that's right. Because hell is, is, remember how Lewis said there's three options, we can either be God, we can be like God and, ex and enjoy him in creaturely response, or he can be miserable. Well that last one, miserable, is a life not of human flourishing, not of integrating head heart that flows into helping hands, but it's a life of disintegration. And that's I think what ultimately hell is. And that's what I think these images are. So I, I find that helpful. I found that, that section with Keller really helpful on that. Okay, so what is the traditional doctrine of hell? There it is, and it's on your structure notes. Those adult human beings who do not exercise explicit faith in Jesus Christ in this life will, after this life, experience conscience torment forever in a place called hell. Now it's important that you guys know, I think you do know, but there's some people, uh, you know, not all accept the traditional doctrine of hell. Uh, Universalists, what do they teach? Who's in hell? No one. So there might be a place called hell, but it's just unpopulated. Um, you know, all will be saved, hell is empty. So there's universalists, and there's this question, I guess two years ago when we were at CSU with uh, Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. You know, is he a universalist, and he's not very clear on that, and so we had to engage that stuff a lot um, then. But there's universalists. Uh, there's also annihilationalists. And what do they hold to? Not eternal, and co yeah, cease to coexist, good. Um, so here you have, there might be, there are people that are consigned to hell, but those people that are consigned to hell, they cease to exist. So there's no, it's not everlasting conscious existence. No, you're just, you're just um, wiped out. You, don't, you no longer exist. You're annihilated. Okay? Uh, uh, further, some might argue that hell is simply a place where you go if you don't want to enjoy God. You know, uh, I think that is part of hell, but it's also a place of punishment. I think scripture is clear. You know, the wages of sin is death. Uh, the penalty for our sin is separation from God. I mean, th these kinds of things are pretty clear that it's, it's a punishment as well as a natural consequence for our sin. Um, still, this traditional doctrine that, that is sort of encapsulated here, this is what I, most you know, evangelical Christians, this is the view that's held. But you do know there's people that reject it for various reasons. So if we hold to this view, if we hold to the traditional doctrine of hell, well, then we've got some obje objections that come our way. And the first objection is this charge you see up on the, on the screen as well as in your notes, is that that view of hell as eternal conscious punishment for the wicked, well, that view of hell is just incompatible with a loving God. Why would a loving God um, send people to hell? And on your structured notes, I give two, I think, two responses. This first one, actually both of these are from the book, from Bill Craig's book. Um, so I offer them to you. This is what Bill says. He says, in a very real sense, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Um, this is C.S. Lewis's view as well. Uh, you know, in fact, Scripture is clear that God wills the salvation of every human being. You've got two passages uh, there, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have or come to re repentance. 1 Timothy 2, 4. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So in one sense, now it's not the only sense of this, but in one sense, God doesn't send anybody to hell. On this line, it would be we send ourselves to hell. Uh, it's a matter of us freely choosing to reject God. Thus, those who are lost are self-condemned. Okay? So that would be one, one thing to say. I think the second thing is probably a, 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 a sort of double-clicking on that. Hell becomes a natural consequence for sinners. This is what C.S. Lewis picked up. Um, Oh, sorry, I should turn my phone off. C.S. Lewis picked this up as well. Um, he said, those who fail to accept Christ's sacrifice on the cross as payment for sin put themselves in a state which would lead them very naturally to prefer hell uh, than, than heaven because they're self-lovers and God-haters. And so, in effect, they would prefer, if, if you know, they would choose it all, they would prefer hell instead of heaven. And so... Um, 
Let's see, on this view, hell, think about it this way, heaven would be utterly odious to somebody who spent his whole life rejecting or putting, you know, clenching his fist to God. And so the idea is that the natural consequence of a life of rebellion is that God, who's a respecter of persons, and he respects even our human dignity and freedom to the end, will, con will ultimately give us what we want. And that's, that's the natural consequence uh, view here. It's a natural consequence of our sin, and God is just honoring our human dignity and allowing us to go where, in fact, we would choose to go. And so you see this quote by Lewis. This is from The Problem of Pain. He's got a chapter in the, in the book, The Problem of Pain, on the question of hell. And you can see what he says there. I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the end. That the doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved, just as the blessed, forever submitting to obedience, become through all eternity more and more free. And actually, uh, Keller also picks up this, this natural consequence thing where he says, hell then is the trajectory of the soul. This is out of your book. Living a self-absorbed, self-centered life going on and on forever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, they would, yeah, I mean, so it's a problem for Calvinism. It's, so so one, of the main, uh, one of the main problems for Calvinism, or, or actually there's two. One is that um, this view of human freedom, most people would say, doesn't, isn't consistent with our intuitions about freedom. Our intuition about freedom is that we are morally responsible only we are morally culpable only for that which we are responsible. But if God is the one who caused us to do X, well then how are we responsible for that? So that's a problem that many people see here. The other problem is exactly your question. It's the problem of evil and the problem of hell. It seems to be that God is actually the one on the hook because God is the one who willed it. And so you get into all these debates over the reprobate, whether God, is that just? Is it a just God to create somebody that he already knows and wills from all eternity will in fact be consigned to hell? You know, is that even a life worth living, some would ask. Um, and so I would just say that's, a, that's one of the problems that's, that's going to be turned up a little bit for the Calvinist. Now, of course, if you're a Molinist or something else, you'll have other problems. And so we all have our costs. And that's what I think I would say to you on this debate, is at some way, in, in some point, we all have costs, wherever we land on this thing. And the question is, well, which costs are we most comfortable living with? Yeah. Well, um, it could be distinct. So it could be, if, if we just said, um, those who go to cell, it's just a natural consequence of your sin, and that they just go wherever, the, and they want to go there anyhow. Well, if that was all hell was, I think it would be a little, dis your question would have some bite. But I think, I mean, it's a good question, but that, that would be a great question to raise in any context. But I, I'm most inclined to say that this natural consequence is actually part of our punishment. So I think hell is a place of punishment, primarily, and part of that punishment for our sin is that we uh, are given over to the natural consequences of our sin, in this case, hell, disintegration, eternal torment, and so on. So if you, so if you think about it the way I'm thinking about it, it's a both and. It is a natural consequence of a life of God-hate, but it's also punishment for a life of God-hate. And so I, I don't know, um, that helps me a little bit with that. Okay, so, but, but for our purposes, I guess just to understand or maybe even apologetically, the big picture thing uh, is that it's not, that hell is not incompatible with an all-loving God. You've got this conclusion here on your structure notes. It's not incompatible. God is a respecter of persons and ultimately hell is respecting human free will. I think perhaps the next challenge is the more difficult one and it's, it's acute for both you know, it's a key for all the views, especially the first three. You know, it's a key for any of those views. And that's the question of, well, is hell compatible with the justice of God? So on your structure notes, let's see, what have you got? Okay, that is, even if people freely condemn themselves to hell by rejecting God's love, the, the charge is it's still unjust of God uh, to condemn people forever. You know, that, why forever? That seems a little... Um, 
unfair. You know, and sometimes it's asked like this, how can a finite amount of sin that one commits in this life result in an infinite punishment? And so the crime doesn't fit the punishment. And that just seems unjust. Uh, you know, if I lie to you, so that, that warrants eternal separation from God forever? That doesn't seem quite right, or something like that. So that's kind of how the obje- objection is, is sometimes posed. Okay? Now there's two responses to this as well. One, and I find these both plausible, I find both of these interesting. Uh, the first is to say, look, I, I think you're right. No wrong in this life can deserve an infinite punishment. Still, it could be that those in hell continue to sin on forever for all of eternity. This was the line that Bill Craig suggested. I think he suggested both of these in your book. Um, so the unre- unredeemed sinner in hell eternally raises his fist at God, uh, earning, thus earning an eternal condemnation. And so Bill talks about how hell is self-perpetuating on this view. You know, that we'll just sin forever and ever and ever in hell. Thus, an infinite number of sin deserves an infinite punishment. You know, it's interesting, it's plausible, uh, perhaps. The second way is to say, yeah, the objector, um, argue the objector is mistaken in the supposition that the sins we commit in this life only merit a finite penalty. penalty. Now, this does seem plausible to me, and I think we can drive this one a little bit. Um, Why? Well, because all sins are ultimately sins against God. Even if they're not directly sins against God, and as such, each sin is of of infinite weight uh, and and, the amount, and amounts to a transgression against an infinitely great being. And so I say in your structure notes, consider a legal analogy. And, and here's the analogy. Uh, say you were going to wrongly kill a dog, or say somebody did that for, you know, by accident, or, or just you killed a dog. Well, presumably, you wouldn't be charged, you, know, you wouldn't be given the death penalty for that. And you probably wouldn't even be given a life sentence um, you know, in jail. But if you wrongfully killed a human being, say a child, well, you, you would probably be get, get life in prison, and perhaps even the death penalty. And the question is, well, why? What's the difference? Well, the gravity of the, the offense depends in part on the type of being offended. And so humans, we would say, are priceless. So Kant talked about that in the history of philosophy. He said that human beings are of, uh, of great worth and dignity. They're literally priceless. Like, you can't put a price on them. You can't go to the pet store and say, oh, $750 for Billy Bob. You know, there, there's no pet store where you can buy a human for some price. Um, and if you did, that would be a really scary pet store, right? Um, but you can go and buy a dog for $750 or less or whatever, because you can put a monetary value on them. And of course, we would say that within Christianity as well, that we are literally priceless because we're created in the image of God. And that's why when a human is killed, it's a much greater crime than when a dog or a a bird or something is killed. (coughs) And if that's the case, if that's not implausible, well then it's not implausible to think that offenses committed against God, who is infinitely greater than any human being, would merit a greater penalty. In fact, you know, an infinite, infinitely great penalty. Okay, do you guys kind of see at least how that goes, the structure of that? Let's see. So, so I find those kinds of things plausible. Um, you know, the reality of hell is not inconsistent with the justice of God. I love there's this quote, which you've got there in your, um, on your structure notes. This is by, it's from Keller, but it's by a guy named Miroslav Volf. He says, if God were not angry at injustice and deception, and did not make a final end to violence, that, would not, that God would not be worthy of worship. And so think about if... Uh, what, how just would God be in a world that's has, that is full of holocausts and, and human evil that is horrendous? How just would God be if there wasn't a, a place of punishment for that kind of injustice? And, so, and, that, and of course, uh, Wolf here was a survivor of the, of the holocaust when he says that. So, okay, thoughts? Yeah, good. Is there, um, a, is there any scriptural evidence for that in the first one that sin continues on through hell? No, I'm not aware of any. Um, I think those are kind of like your scripture is undetermined and we're free to kind of think tentatively about plausible responses. I would put that in that category. Yeah, so these are suggestions, ways to show they're not incompatible. Okay, well, let's, um, let's watch a video. By the way, you had asked about links. Uh, the Problem of Evil video that, we sh- that I showed the other day, if you type in Google this, this is the name of that video. Evil, pain, suffering equals no God, question mark, and you'll get that one. 
The one that you're about to see, as well as any of the Andy, Andy Wilson ones, some of you were asking, that's just from his DVD from the book, uh, Notes from a Tilt-O-Wheel. If you guys heard of that? I think some of our freshman survival kits use that DVD. But I, I'm just pulling uh, video clips from that DVD. So if you like those, if you want to find those, that's where you find those. We'll watch one actually now. So any questions before we watch a little video? Take a break. Hell is a real place. So if reality is a story, if reality is art like we've talked about, hell and heaven is really a question of shadow or light. Evil, what we would call evil, what you want to hang on to, what you want to cherish and, and save in yourself, and righteousness, where you let go of yourself, you are purified. A lot of people like to think that hell is some sort of ethereal little absence, emptiness. We don't know what hell is. We don't like to talk about it because, well, it's a little bit judgmental to say that you may or may not be going to hell. And I was in a conversation with some friends. In graduate school, we were in a pub, and she looks at me and says, do you think I'm going to hell? Why does God allow people to end up here? Or, or even more actively, why does God send them into the outer darkness? My immediate answer was just a question. Don't you want to? You just told me even if there was this God, you wouldn't serve him. If this God turns out to be real, do you want to spend eternity with him? Do you want to be in his presence? If you hate him, if you do not want to be with him, why would he keep you there? It's a kindness of him to not make you. I don't think anybody in hell would say, I want to be here. But all of them, I think, will want to be there more than in heaven. And as we each die, as we each reach our mortality, we're going to have a final conversation. There's going to be a moment of, will you bend or will you leave? Will you serve or will you go off to this place and serve yourself and follow your own desires into the darkness? Those are your choices. He's going to spread his goodness over every planet, over, over every sphere, and into every corner of this universe. He's going to be everywhere. His righteousness will be everywhere. And if you hate that, if you despise it, where, where, where can you be? Where do you want to go? And we're right back to the problem of evil. Right back again, where people say, how could an all-good, all-powerful God throw me in hell forever and just leave me there. You're either in this throne room, in his presence, which you despise, or you are outside of it. You're cast out, you're in the darkness, which is hell. Is that a problem? Is it a problem for an all good God not to keep you in his presence when he hates everything you stand for and you hate everything he stands for? That's to put it on a, on a human level. Two people, if these were two people, would you want to share the same room? And the answer is you don't. You hate him. He'll cast you out. What do you have to complain about? It's where you would choose to go anyway. And when it comes to the end, and, and you really have to choose, will you bend before your maker, or will you go into the darkness, which is a real darkness and a real place, where you're gonna be left with nothing but yourself, and your own pettiness and your own evils. The question is, which part of the picture are you gonna be? Are you gonna be that black shadow, that darkness underneath the tree, or are you gonna be up in the branches in the sun? Where will you be? It's not a question of, oh, God must be evil because there's still hell. And of course, there are people who say, I, I do love God. I don't want to be in the shadow. I don't want to be doing what I am doing, whatever, whatever sin that they happen to be struggling with, because everyone is struggling with something, great or small. They want to let go of it. They, they want to be in the light, and they just don't know how. How do you start? Are you here? Are you alive? Do you have fingers? Do you breathe? Are you part of the swirl of this reality? Start with some sort of appreciation for your senses, for your family, for anything, and then thank him for it. Begin with gratitude, and then move on to thanking him for everything, even your struggles, your trials, the darknesses, the things you have to overcome before you reach your final chapter. This is straight from the Apostle Paul. In all things, give thanks. Enjoy your ice cream. All right, last thing, and then we'll, um, we'll take our break. Oh, wow, did we, yeah, we didn't even get to, hmm. Let's, uh, do we want to talk more about the fate of the unevangelized? Do we do, we did that a little bit. I'm not sensing any great. I think all I would want to say is, well, I think that Bill does an interesting uh, discussion of that that uh, maybe we can talk to you later. Let, let, me, let me just say this, and we'll take a break, and if we want to revisit these things, we can. But um, what's interesting about uh, 
this question of religious pluralism. Let me just try to land this defeater belief. We can come back to it if we have more time later this week, maybe on Friday, maybe not. Um, but the question is, in, face, in the face of all these world religions, uh, I really like what Keller, again, has to say. He doesn't talk about it as much in uh, the book, The Reason for God, but elsewhere he talks about how he reminds us that there's not two ways to live, but there's three ways to live. Have you guys heard this? It's really helpful. You know, there's not two ways to live, but there's three ways. And typically, he says, we, we think that there's two ways to live. And the two ways would be, um, and they're both self-salvation approaches to life. And one of those would be the religious way. The religi religious way says that I need to earn my own salvation. You know, I need to earn my own forgiveness for sins. And so we can kind of summarize it. This is a, a way to work. Works righteousness. So this is still a self-salvation way of living. The religious way. And then there's the irreligious way that says, I don't need God. I don't need God for salvation. It's a running away from the God that pursues. And he says that both of these, you know, we typically think there's only two ways, religious or irreligious. He says both of those are self-salvation ways of living. And Keller says there's a third way to live. And the third way is the gospel-centered life. And the gospel-centered life is a life where we rest and we receive God's grace. And we say, we are a sinner saved by the grace of God. You know, that, thus, but for the grace of God, I would not be saved. And I love, as we think about the fact that there's not two ways, but three ways to live, as we think about all the religions of the world, I'm just reminded of the incredible uniqueness of Christianity because of grace. This is, that is an incredibly uh, unbelievable, you know, thing about Christianity. We cannot earn our way to God. In fact, I love Keller talks about grace as an undeserved gift from an unobligated giver. That's what grace is. And only in Christianity do we celebrate the scandal of grace that's called the cross. And because of that scandal of grace, I think that we can boldly pro proclaim the beauty and the truth of Christianity in the face of all these religions, because all they are is self-salvation ways of trying to live. But we offer something unique. Yes, it's true, remember? But, when, but it was, we also get Jesus, and we get this scandal of grace that is utterly unique in all the faces of religion. And that's, I guess, ultimately the answer to religious pluralism, is grace. And it's the scandal of the cross. And that's why in our conversations, we always bring it back to Christ.